Hear ye, hear ye, I call to order this fifth meeting of the Sci-Fi Ge Sci Geeks Club. Welcome, everybody. I'm Lord Chancellor Dave Nelson. Joining me is Chief Minister Matt Stein, also here, Master of the Rolls of the Court of Chancellery, Brad you just call Brad. Just call Brad fat. <laughs> Dude, seriously? What, right out of, of the, the game. <laughs> Thank you very long, Matt. I, I gotta set the tone. Set the yeah, tone man. early. <laughs> man, that bar is being raised real high right now. I gotta be honest with you. Right? <laughs> Welcome, the Gary. Are sweating. The are sweating. And, and Archduchess Anessa Moyens. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, Sci-Fi Geeks Club. And uh, let's welcome our guest. He's an Emmy-nominated storyboard artist, all-around comic book guy. He's uh, worked in the animation departments of The Simpsons and King of the Hill. Uh, and he's trying to raise $5,000 for the Cancer Aid and Research Fund at the lastpodcast.com. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and welcome to the Sci-Fi Geeks Club, Gary Yap. Woohoo! That was a very nice introduction. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for coming on, Gary. Uh, no, it's a, it's a pleasure. I, I should probably preface this. I am very, very, very uh, nervous. I had the <laughs> greatest podcast for you guys. Uh, about an hour ago in my head, and it went really, really, really well. So I'm pretty sure I'll screw this up now. I was, I, you know, I, oh, I, I was, I was, I was witty. I was clever. I, I, I gave all the right answers an hour ago. You can tell we take things very seriously around here, Gary. So uh, it, you're, you're putting too much thought on this, Gary. Don't worry about it. You're, you're going to be great. Okay. Be all right. All right, so this is kind of a review of the uh, week's sci-fi news. So we kind of just get together and uh, each bring a story to the table. And, um, well, before we get into it, though, let's talk about uh, your career a little bit, Gary, and uh, why and how you're raising money for the Cancer Aid and, Aid and Research Fund. Um, Actually, it, it originally started, uh, believe it or not, um, uh, it was a professional wrestling idea. Uh, I did it bec uh, for two friends of mine, uh, Anthony Maris and Sean Brotherton. Both lost their fathers to cancer in the last year. And um, it's kind of an understatement to say that at some point in time, almost everyone I know of at least is affected by cancer or knows someone affected by cancer. And it's, it's so it, my um, Uncle Davey, passed away literally a little over a month ago. So so it, it it's something that started out for a couple of friends, and we were all um, at one point or another involved in the professional wrestling business, so we thought we'd put together something professional wrestling related that could go towards something positive, which was raising money for the Cancer Aid and Research Fund. And uh, it kind of... I, I, we, we had our first event December 13th of last year. I wasn't really crazy about it, uh, I wanted to figure out a better way to bring awareness to it, so I had been, um, as a goof, been doing these, because of my history on the King of the Hill and the Simpsons, um, been doing these commission pieces for people who um, want to have themselves drawn into the universe of King of the Hill or universe of the Simpsons, and... I've been doing that as, as a side goof for years. We used to do it even on the show, you know, we'd... Um, our, whoever would do our taxes, we'd draw them uh, with the guys on King of the Hill <laughs> having a beer in front of the fence. Um, and then Christmas 2012, uh, as a goof, I put it up on Etsy, and I got just barraged with, with orders. <laughs> and so much so that I was completing commissions that I had received for Christmas gifts up until March of oh, wow. 2013. I mean, it was it's it's uh, it was it was insane. So uh, a, a client of mine, uh, someone who I'd done a commission for, his name's Bill. He put uh, a commission I did on a site which I was unfamiliar with at the time called Reddit, and that was November of this past year, and. Once more, the the floodgates were open, and 
Um, after December 13th of last year, after our, our Ring of Hope wrestling show, I was trying to think of ways to, to, to help bring money to, to the charity. And I thought about that. I thought, you know, these, these things seem to be very, very popular. So why don't I use that um, and as, as an excuse to me kind of get the, get the word out there? Uh, uh, ha- and I, I told myself that um, I'm actually still right now as of this day, uh, doing commissions, just like last year, that are pre-Christmas ordered. I got about five more left. And then I, the, the next round of commissions I begin, half of every single commission will be going to the Cancer Aid and Research Fund directly. Uh, as they're finished, I'll go ahead and post them on my Twitter and thank whoever the person was who ordered the commission. And... Uh, uh, Give half the money to the lastpodcast.com, the GoFundMe account that goes straight to the Cancer Aid and Research Fund. And that's kind of what I'm also here to do is just pimp the crap out of it. And Matt is the person who can probably vouch for uh, the commissions because that is how I met him. Yeah, no, uh, so. we got to see his uh, the commission that you did for him, and it's, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And it took a long time. And, and, and the one thing, I guess, which also contributes to my nervousness about this whole thing is – is I, there are very few things on this planet I do right, but at least, at the very least, I, I have a, a really, really strong work ethic. And I don't like half-assing anything, and, and which is probably why I'm nervous right now about how I'm coming off or how I appear, because I want to do this right, and I want to be entertaining, and I want to be enlightening, and I, and I, and I want to uh, 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 hammer like an idiot and forget everything I wanted to say. <laughs> so, you're doing a great job, Gary. Yeah. No, you're doing uh, great for Gary. Let's just jump into it real quick. But before okay. we do, though, I'm going to do and By the way, And by the way, I did do my homework. I went and I, and I listened to the first four podcasts. So so I, I am familiar with everything. Uh, uh, I, I think I can bring something to this. I'm hoping. You know, we'll see. Okay. So. Before we start, i got to do something technical on my end real quick. So hang okay. on. Is this the part where Gary asked for four hours of his life back for listening to previous podcasts? No. <laughs> That's more than I've heard of the previous podcasts. I haven't listened to last week's episode. Uh, I, I've been there. I don't really need to listen to them. <laughs> well, see, I wasn't there, though. So uh, I'm such a narcissist, I have to listen to myself again. So Do you listen to yourself to at work? Uh, actually, because I, I post them... We post them on galacticnetcasts.com. I also work for um, a broadcast group, Midwest Communications, and we post these also on our websites um, as well. So I always like to, I have to process the audio. I have to drop it down so it fits within a, a certain file size. So I usually, you know, listen for a bit. Um, there was a point before Dave started doing some of the editing of, of, of uh, you know, profanity. I did mm-hmm. some of the editing of that at the time, so I kind of got into the habit of uh, listening. So, uh-huh. And then also I try to listen to, you know, gosh, you know, I was talking this way. Maybe I could do something a little bit different. Uh, right. you know, I, I work with radio people, so I think I've kind of picked up a, on some of their habits right. um, to try to, you know, it's, this is fun to do, but it would be cool to just kind of be, but you know, just like you, you want to kind of be better at what you do and try to. Well, do especially it. because this day and age, you know, every single person down the street has a podcast, and sure. and yep. and the hardest thing about this whole thing is gaining traction. Yes, there are a yeah. thousand podcasts out there, but why do I want to listen to this one? Why do I want to listen to this one? You know, and you yep. want to at least bring something to the table that makes someone go, okay, you know what? I'll spend an hour there. Yeah, I don't yeah. mind that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh. oh, exactly. Everyone's time is precious, and when there's so much information and technology at your fingertips, like like Gary yeah. said, you got to pick and choose where yeah. you want to put your free time. And, and there's so many hours, like you said, there are so many hours in the day, and you can't spend 24 of those hours listening to podcasts. So you do, you pick and choose. Like this is good, and you can and you can uh, you can drop some. You can say I listened to this one for three episodes, and you know what? It just it just wasn't speaking to me. You know. Um, <laughs> Uh, finding your, as Brad said, just finding your voice. Uh, uh, yep. You know, Brad, what's been your experience about what is the is there is there something that uh, is there a cardinal sin that you, is there is there a list of things you realize you know like I, I, this is the, what I don't want to do is this. 
Um, you know, the biggest cardinal sin, I think, is not being interesting. <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, yes. You know, very you, true. You, you, you find in, in radio, um, you know, in, in listening and, and being around radio people, I work in, in, in the web division, so okay. I work more on the websites, but... Yeah, you know, I've been with the company for almost 17 years now, and I've you know been talking to them and, and stuff like that. And everybody picks a a persona. You know, they have right. their own particular voice that they they brand a, a character that they portray, and they do that to you know be interesting and try to you know hook in with right. with people. And you can't really speak in a monotone voice and be you know read stuff directly and just okay. not have an opinion. You know, you want to put some life into it, be interesting, and of course, and I'm waving my hands around, which does not work in radio, really, um, and if people are just listening to the audio uh, podcast of this, they're not going to see me waving my hands around like a madman, but if they watch the video version of this, right. they do, um, and now I'm yammering too, and um, so yeah, uh, being uninteresting, uh, and I think Dave Stretch. can... Stretch. Yeah, that's, yes. that's what I was working for, really. That, All right. that, that's... That's what I was working for. <laughs> Are you guys ready? You guys ready to go? Yes. yes. All right, Brad, why don't you read us the minutes from last week? All right. Uh, last week, uh, when we uh, spoke with our guest geek, Jackie Hearn, uh, we talked about Star Wars Episode Seven cast and plot rumors. Uh, those rumors kind of uh, were highlighting uh, Oldman and Cumberbatch, uh, Gary Oldman, Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, working on the set, and Adam Driver has been set to play the villain uh, for that, uh, at least for that movie, if not more. Uh, the next story that we talked about was Nike is working to make their advanced power lace shoes from Back to the Future 2, and they are set to do it and hit the 2015 deadline. So that should be interesting. <laughs> uh, the U.S. Army is actually, and this is a honest-to-God true story, they are working on building... Armor that is not unlike our man. Uh, our man. Our uh, man. Now, now completely jumped universes to DC. Um, Iron Man. Uh, they won't fly, but they will have uh, protective capabilities, uh, weapons capabilities, um, and things of that nature. Uh, we all kind of agreed that the new Godzilla movie uh, trailer that we saw looked pretty, pretty kick-ass. Uh, no, there's the first one. Uh, we talked more about uh, the Amazon uh, Barbarella remake. Um, you know, Jackie was a fan of that, so we, we discussed that for a bit. I'm a fan, too, and we uh, agreed that Duran Duran is the greatest 80s band that ever lived. And we, oh, discovered, yeah. that, and we yes. discovered that Jackie knows members of Duran Duran, and we were very all very like uh, impressed by that, of course. <laughs> yeah. And I got um, to remind Dave how old he is. Yes, like every show. Like I, every I, show. I, I used to like you, Matthew. I, um, I didn't. See, but Dave is only a couple years older than myself. I, oh, you know, boy, that just really <laughs> took a dark turn. Okay, hey, the last thing that we awkward. talked about uh, was uh, uh, we talked a little bit about the passing of Harold Ramis, uh, which was truly sad. Um uh, but we uh, discussed about our famous or our favorite Harold Ramis movies and and some of uh, you know what what it meant to us um, you know growing up watching these great comedic movies and and um, how they made us feel so that wraps up what we spoke about last week all right on to new business our stories of the week and I will get things going here with a little Star Trek news we talked about Star Wars last week this week. We are talking about Star Trek Into Darkness. And you guys remember that when that movie came out, we're like, seems like there could be some things missing. There was like, I'm sure that there's some deleted scenes somewhere that they didn't <laughs> put in the movie. Well, um, they were made available through a weird, like, back way. Um, apparently, uh, in the DVD and Blu-ray releases... There was no deleted scenes. You know how in in usually they have extra features on DVDs and Blu-rays. Yes. Um, there was no extra like uh, deleted scenes from the DVD or Blu-ray, but they have turned up um, via Xbox uh, via the Xbox Video Store. Uh, if you use the Smart Glass second screen app to mm. view, a bunch of deleted scenes popped up. 
and um, some people captured them, and here is basically a synopsis of the major deleted scenes that uh, were not included in the movie. Among other things, there is a longer version of Kirk's discussion with Pike after Kirk is reprimanded. Do you remember the um, trailer for Star Trek Into Darkness? There was this whole scene about, or this whole like monologue from from the Admiral talking about how Kirk was reckless, and uh, yep. and I watched the movie and never heard that, the audio from that in the actual movie, and that was a, actually a deleted scene. So that's one deleted scene. There's also uh, a scene where Carol Mar- or Carol Marcus. Uh, explains the reason why she has a British accent and her dad doesn't. <laughs> her, her, that was a big question, right? It was like, no. wait a second, her dad doesn't have a British accent, but she does. What the hell is going on? Uh, well, it turns out her mom and her, like, she grew up in London, but her dad is is American. That That's the explanation for that. Um, there is a scene where Uhura has a much longer conversation with the Klingons, and it's pretty cool because she talks about like uh, meeting her lover, or like her lover, like escaped to Kronos, and they were going after her lover. And um, if she has to die, she'll die with honor. And it was really cool, like true, like to the core of Star Trek and the whole the whole Klingon mythos um, in that scene. And I wish they would have kept that in in the in the uh, the final product. Um, there's a longer fight scene on Kronos with those Klingons. Uh, there's also a sequence in which we uh, saw in the trailer where Kirk falsifies his log mission. He actually says, Captain's log, blah, blah, blah. Nothing happened on that planet at the very beginning of the film when we all know that something major happened in that, at that planet. Um, he's like, oh, they didn't, we're not going to affect their society. Of course, you see that scene with them <laughs> drawing on the sand the picture of the Enterprise and they totally uh, affected their society. So those are this, the uh, deleted scenes from Star Trek Into Darkness that they now, found on Xbox Live. Was, it, was this a deliberate... Uh, did, did the uh, studio deliberately choose to release it this way? Was this oh. a move on their part? It's the most... I, I, when I saw that they hadn't done that, I was like, I bet you. I bet you they're going to come out with something later on, and they're going to make us buy more copies of it those greedy pigs. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> I was exactly, so angry. That's exactly what they do. They, yes. they say, oh, look at this new version with this stuff included this time. You should go buy another version of the, the same film that you bought before. And it's right. like they don't understand that the internet exists <laughs> and that people will <laughs> grab it for you and post it for you, especially if you're like a fan of you know sites like Reddit or, or whatever. Now it, it's gonna... it's on it's on YouTube right now, isn't it? Also, didn't I did I see something like that earlier today where somebody grabbed it, compiled it, and then put it on YouTube? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah they, I'm sure um, they did. Yeah, they don't. They totally did that. Um, yeah. I don't know. The scenes that I saw were not YouTube clips. Okay. So maybe somebody took the clips that I saw and uh, made those into YouTube and updated or uploaded them to YouTube. So uh, yeah, they're definitely out there now. Whether okay. whether Paramount wants it or not, they are out. They're out in the wild. It's too late. Okay. They've been released. Um, just Welcome so to the internet. That's not, yeah, I mean, I mean no I'm not kidding. sure what they were expecting. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I, from, yeah, I'm one of those movie nerds that loves to watch a film on DVD, and especially now with Blu-ray, and then watch all the extra stuff, and then watch the movie again with commentary. Yes. Um, just to kind of oh. get the personal view of you know, the people that were in the film or whatever. Well, you know, and I just... Well, I just that's heard me. Matt, Matt yeah. just made the biggest... Oh. <laughs> oh. I, I like deleted scenes, but commentary is where I draw the line. And I know people like Brad, and it's like, oh, I watch this movie, and then I watch the deleted scenes, and then I watch with commentary in one sitting, and I'm like, where do you have the attention span? I tried to watch... I actually uh, was going to watch this movie on Monday... I was going to watch this, and uh, next Friday, because that came with someone quoted next Friday at work, so I'm like, I got to watch that. I got about 45 minutes into next Friday, and I think the movie's hilarious, and I'm like, man, there's so much stuff I could be doing that's not sitting here. So me, the attention span of like a 10-year-old gets up and starts cleaning. Right. And then I yeah, never finish any of the movies, and I, I just, I, I can't sit down and watch movies anymore. I think society has ruined me. What no, about putting them on in the background, though? Like putting them on in the background while you're working kind of thing. Yeah, but then I decided to play video games. 
Okay. <laughs> See, but you have the attention span to sit for that. Uh, well, he's well, interacting with that. He technically he's yes. interacting. <laughs> yes. He's interact. <laughs> so let, let me ask you guys something. Uh, do you think any of these scenes would have made the movie better? Because most of you have seen Star Trek Into Darkness, right? Have you seen it, Gary? I have not, uh, only because, and this is one of those things where I definitely want to see it. I actually loved Abrams' first one. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it, it's this whole new, um, hardly getting out to the theater anymore. You know, it's one of the, it, there's this list of films that starts accruing in your head. But I got to I have to see that one. Yeah. I have to see that one. I have to, I, and Star Trek in a Darkness is one of them. Iron Man 3, I haven't seen yet. And I'm a huge Shane Black fan, and I still haven't seen that. Sure, yep. You know, but it seems like, as we were talking earlier, there are so many hours in the day, and it just it just gets by. It just gets by. It gets by. But I absolutely plan on seeing it, because I really, really, really enjoyed the first one a lot. So, Brad, uh, any of these scenes would make uh, would have made the movie better, do you think? Better? You know, I really wanted to see Uhura interact with the Klingons a little bit more. You know, she was it was so awesome to see her like she was nervous talking to Kirk and Spock. She just had the big fight with Spock about you know, I don't want to spoil anything, but then walks out of the shuttlecraft and she like, you know, has dropped this whole you know this whole thing from the fight, and she just she and she's talking Klingon, and she's she's selling it. She's nervous, and you can kind of see that in her body language, but she's selling it. And I wanted to see her do more than just kind of you know she she's just kind of like angry girlfriend at certain points, and it's like man, eh, that's not interesting. Well, now you're talking to the Klingons, trying to save everybody's lives so they're just not murdered right there on the spot, and it's her time to shine, and they. And now I find out that they cut that. That that scene needed to be a little bit longer because that yeah. fight after that goes on forever. Yeah, Star Trek Into Darkness was definitely heavy on the action. Yeah, and if they would have included this, the scene that I saw, the deleted the scene that I saw, it would have made it that that portion of the film better because it got into that whole like dying with honor thing. Yeah, and she was acting like she was acting like a Klingon. Yep. Yeah, when she was talking to him. So I think that of any of those scenes, I think that one would have been would have made the the movie better, definitely. Vanessa? Right. Vanessa? You guys have pretty much said everything that I'm thinking, so <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. In that case, let us move on to uh, Matt's awesome story of the uh, the next Terminator film. Yes, and the problem with the Terminator film is that it then stemmed into so many other things to talk about, but they have announced Terminator 5, and although the details are still yet pretty shaky, um, it seems that there has been a reliable source uh, that has leaked some of the casting, I guess. Uh, It sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger is uh, back for the fifth one, um, they didn't confirm. <laughs> hey, I promised Schwarzenegger impersonations, <laughs> and I plan to deliver. Um, it sounds like he's coming back as a Terminator. It doesn't say yay or nay about that. Um, Amelia Clark from, I believe it's Game of Thrones, um, and Spike Island will be playing Sarah Connor. Uh, Jason Clark from Zero Dark Thirty and The Great Gatsby will be John Connor. And I'm going to butcher this name, Jai Courtney. There you go, uh, bam. Okay, cool. From I, Frankenstein, and Divergent is playing Kyle Reese, which I don't know how much you guys know about Terminator, but Kyle Reese was the good guy in the first one who was fighting Schwarzenegger. Um, so they're saying that Terminator 5 starts a new standalone trilogy uh, that is essentially a reimagined version of the first trilogy, but the f- first of this trilogy starts during Terminator 2. And then they're gonna like revisit scenes, which is what. Yes, I see your face there, Brad. So they're like. It, it sounds like there's gonna, there's an alternate timeline here. Yes. Sort of. um, and they're gonna take it into the future, which the original trilogy didn't really do until Terminator, Terminator Giant Piece of Shit Salvation. Um, <laughs> it, sounds, it, sounds, it sounds like they're trying to do what Abrams did with the Star Trek, which is they're trying to make it a prequel, a sequel, and uh, and it. 
and to complement also everything that came came before it, kind of thing. In fact, yeah, that story absolutely. that story actually touches on that. That story talks about how it's comparing this new Terminator franchise or this new set of films with the, the Abrams verse for Star Trek. Okay. And I think they're going to start doing that with a lot of you know 80s movies and older, and which is a damn shame, but. Not what? really. I mean, you you kind of have to, especially with the Star Trek movies. And and I know that there are some Trekkies that got really angry at me when I said this, but you have to. There's no way that you're going to reimagine something without angering the people that love the original stuff. Right. Oh and yeah, what, I agree. What Abrams did was brilliant in that they broke the timeline essentially and created a whole different parallel universe. Agreed. And, and Agreed. I think that's the only way that you can really do a tip of the hat to the original material yes. without, without butchering that. and putting off part of the audience that you want to bring into the theater to see it. So, you know, I, I, I think we might see more divergent timeline-based stuff if they want to reimagine uh, stuff from from the past. It's very, yeah. it, it is very, very, very important for fans of franchises or fans of original films to feel like they are at least being acknowledged or respected. And the biggest problem I've always had with this type of scenario is the the reboot that pretends history didn't exist. Yeah. And this, by the way, this is a this is the whole conversation that it can can, stand, can extend into the new Fifty Two, into comics, into yep. TV shows. When there is this disregard for the past, more like you know what, we're, that didn't happen. We're doing it all. Uh, 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 just from scratch, that didn't exist. This is a different universe. And what I loved about the what Abrams Abrams did is he really the world that you know and love it does exist and it still exists. And this now complements it, and it exists in the same reality. It, 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 this is all the same thing, and that is key. I feel if you are expecting. And one would, th one would think that there have to be. If you're expecting fans of the old series, the old franchise, that made this thing a hit in the first place to come on board, you, you got you to gotta extend the olive branch and, and say, you know, we're not crapping on what you loved. Yep. That's interesting because we, we kind of touched on that last week when we were talking about the Star Wars, the new Star Wars movies. Right. Because Abrams is directing the first one. And it sounds like he's bringing, he's he's giving more to do, or giving more jobs, or they're expanding the story more with the original characters, with the the Luke, Leia, Han. Right. Um, so I think he's really trying to bridge that universe as well right. in that franchise. Yes, it's the right it's the right thing to do. And, and as long as it's done good, I guess I don't really care. I mean. Yes, the first Terminator movie probably came out years before I was a thought in my parents' brain. <laughs> oh my god. You're yeah, sorry. Me. Sorry, yeah, guys. Make everybody feel old, doesn't he? <laughs> I saw that in the theater. Oh, wow. That's... Yeah, no kidding. Oh, no. It, okay, it came out a year, a year before I was born, so it wasn't it wasn't that bad. Um, <sighs> shut up. All of you, shut up. Um... <laughs> Anyways, Terminator 5 is set to release June 26th of 2015. Um, is there a stunning. title? Is there, an, is there an actual title yet? Nope, just Terminator 5. Oh, no, excuse no, no, me. No. Yeah. Terminator Genesis. So okay. it's reborn. Okay. It's, it's, it's recreated. They're, they're, uh, they're doing the creation story for, okay. for uh, Terminator, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, and... The new Austrian Death Machine record comes out on April 1st, finally. Which, for those unfamiliar, uh, Austrian Death Machine is a side project of the singer, uh, well, soon to be incarcerated singer of the band Azalea Dying. Um, every song is written based off of an Arnold Schwarzenegger one liner. And <laughs> it is. So yeah, their first their first big song was called "Get to the Chopper," and then and there was like, "It's not a tumor," and they did a Christmas record. Um, that's hilarious. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Yes. Um, one other quick story I just wanted to cover that popped up. Um, I had talked about the Arkham game series previously. I think it was two weeks two weeks ago. Uh, they did announce the final Arkham game called Batman Arkham Knight. 
and the Batmobile is drivable. Done. Take my right. money. Take my Take money. Where's my money? Throwing my wallet at the screen. Yeah. We, just, we just posted the uh, teaser trailer for that today on uh, the Galactic Netcast feed. So I watched it at work, and I was like, well, this is this is going to be a bad time. I'm going to disappear for like a week. <laughs> yeah. It looks pretty cool. It looks, it looks pretty bad. I'm not a gamer, and I'm not really a comic person, but that looks pretty badass. I like it a lot. Yeah, those games are really, well, I mean, they're, it it holds really true to the whole Batman feel. Like, everything's really dark and gritty, and you get to play some freaking Batman and play with all of his little toys and kick the crap out of people. I mean, there's not a bad thing about that game. Any of the games, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've got the, the demo of the first one on my uh, Xbox, and I'm stuck at a certain point. Is it the part where you're supposed to buy the game to play the rest of it? <laughs> or wait, no, actually, I think it... First off, one, suck it. Two, uh, I, actually, I think I got to... Because uh, I've got uh, Xbox Live, so I think I, I think I actually download. I got the first one. I do have the first one that was offered free if you've got Xbox Live, yeah, Xbox Gold. Maybe you just need some help, Brad. You need yeah, I, well, when Anessa moves in, she can she can help me out there. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Your woman can show you how to use video games. Manly. <laughs> I've Number played three, once in a while. Suck it. Wow. <laughs> Matt, welcome, welcome sexism. Ah, I am on a roll. My wife is still I, I out of town to for work. I happen to own Arkham so. City, so... Oh. Not... I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but I bought it. It was on sale. I own a lot of video games that I've never had time to play. It's called Steam Summer Sales, and they are the worst. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm still no, in the I middle don't... of playing Shadowrun Returns. Ugh. See, Matt, when, just... you, when, you, when you get all these games, and you have all these games you haven't played, do you, is it your bucket list to finish every single one of them, or are there games you will never get to and you know it? Um, I I play I at least play every game I buy. Uh, the, the length of time in which I put into it varies based on how well it holds my uh, my interests. Um, okay. Some of them end up just being a turd. Will you no way around will, it? If you if you get to a part of a game that you enjoy, but you but for some reason you can't get past a certain part. Will you not stop until you beat it, or will you say, oh, screw this, I, I, I'm not playing this? I will Google the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I buy it, and I, I've gone back and uh, with a bunch of like 80, uh, 80s and 90s point-and-click adventure games that I couldn't mm -hmm. beat when I was a kid, um, and I will literally just read the walkthrough and play through the game because I want to okay. play the story. I don't want to sit and scratch my head for hours trying to figure out, you know, how do you fart into the jar and then make the person <laughs> pass out. So you're <laughs> Just, okay, let me let me. I the South the South Park RPG came out yesterday, and I've been playing that for all of my free time. And there's so much farting in the game. Your right click <laughs> is fart, uh, and all of your magic is farts. And you like cup a fart and throw it at people, and you can fart and then make it go to a different part of the screen and distract people. It's probably the greatest game I've played in a long time. <laughs> What? <laughs> we digress. All right, let's move on with the news. Um, going from a serious thing to a somewhat serious but awesome, awesome story. Brad, you got something cool. Yes. Um, so this was uh, on. Uh, I saw this on BuzzFeed. Um, Peter Capaldi and uh, Jenna. Oh my. Coleman. Thank Coleman. you, Jenna Coleman. Uh, um, we're filming uh, in Cardiff. They're working on, obviously, the, the new uh, season of Doctor Who. And there was this little girl, and she was dressed in this gold Dalek outfit. And uh, you're not sure who made it for her, but she just looks adorable in this thing. And it's all fabric and... Um, she, she's such a huge fan of Doctor Who, and uh, she's a big fan of of Matt Smith. And Matt Smith happens to be her invisible friend. So she has an invisible friend named Matt Smith, and it's the Matt Smith from Doctor Who. 
Now this little girl has autism, and uh, you know my my son has autism as well. So to have that fundamental shift of her invisible friend Matt Smith is no longer on Doctor Who. She's no longer going to see him on on TV. That was very upsetting to her. So she, the little girl, and her aunt <clears throat> were uh, on set, or well, actually off to the side watching them film some of the uh, uh, the stuff in Cardiff. <clears throat> and uh, Peter Capaldi came over because you know, she's dressed as a little Dalek, and got to talk to the little girl. And he actually, you know, like crouched down with her and 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 got to find out that you know this whole thing that Matt Smith was her invisible friend. And that she was really kind of having a hard time dealing with the transition from the you know Matt Smith doctor to, to Peter Capaldi's. So uh, on video, somebody took a video uh, of him talking with the little girl and actually going through his iPhone and finding a picture of him, Matt Smith, and Jenna Coleman together. And he said, hey, you know, here's a picture of all of us together. And they said that, you know, I can be Doctor Who and hopefully you'll you'll be okay with me being the doctor. And it was just a really sweet, tender moment. And it's one of those times when you realize how big of a deal Doctor Who is, and you cannot be a jerk and be the doctor. You just can't. You know, he's. it's hard for people to, I think, maybe separate the doctor a little bit from the actor, but the actor also has to... Be willing to to connect with people, and and you know one of the things that Peter Capaldi um, said that Matt Smith gave him as advice is take care of the doctor. In other words, you know don't be that guy. Be be the good guy that tries to reach out to people and ha takes the time to talk to the fans. That's what they that's what they want. I think they they've come to expect it a little bit and. It's just a good thing to do, you know. You gotta it's, be it's, really. You gotta have your stuff together to be to take on the character of the Doctor, because there's not only the show, but there's the fans and everything that surrounds it. And this is just one. This is just one of those examples. Yeah, of absolutely. Stuff as and, as the actor. And it was just so adorable that you know Peter Capaldi and Jenna Coleman were both crouched down. <clears throat> you know, talking to this little girl, and uh, they actually got a a group shot of the aunt, the little girl, and Peter Capaldi for her to have. So, you know, just as a way to kind of help her transition a little bit and accept that there is a a new doctor. So yeah, I'm sure she's I'm sure she's going to be fine with it now. I mean, to have that kind of to have that interaction with with the doctor, yep. you know, it's going to turn her turn her around real real quick. Yeah, no, it was just really heartwarming and, and something that really kind of spoke to me at, at, at kind of an, at an obvious level uh, with my son having autism. So just had to share that with everybody. It was really cool. That's a great story. Gary, uh, Gary are you a fan of Doctor Who? Uh, I, have never, I have never seen a Doctor Who ever. It's another one of those things that uh, I know. It's one of the things I know of. I, I have a friend who watches it, and I asked him once a long time ago, uh, since the series, the, the history of the series is so daunting. Um, I have asked, and I've never gotten proper responses, where is the, if one wanted to watch it, where do they pick up on? And, you know, depends, where is the place to start? It, it depends on how much time that you have, because <laughs> if you have plenty of time, start from 2005 and go up. But I think if you wanted to, if you were limited time, you could start with the Matt Smith Doctor, Brad. Don't you think? I mean, there's. Now, I, know, but, now, but I should probably say. I should probably say. I actually have unlimited time. I mean, most of the time when I am working, I am running stuff in the background. I mean, I, I see a lot of stuff that way. I, I have nothing to do. You, you, just drawing all day or coloring all day. There's stuff constantly going. Now, also a big key for me is accessibility too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it, like. In that case, Gary, start from 1962. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, no, where, no, like I, oh, I go think, ahead. No, I was gonna say I really think starting from 2005 with yeah. number nine and working your way to the present, and then maybe going back because it's really, especially like the past maybe two or three seasons where they really started to 
make references to previous villains and characters. Yep. And so I really think that going from 2005, because it's kind of a brief reintroduction to who the Doctor is, okay. and then you kind of build your way up, and then they start making references back to different characters and villains and monsters and whatnot, and then just go back and maybe start from 1963. And, and the great thing Doctor. is, Gary, the, uh, everything from 2005 on is pretty much available on Netflix. <clears throat> on Netflix, right? Netflix, yep. and I think Hulu Plus now, too. Yeah, yeah. They I actually, think that's a recent thing. Yeah, Hulu Plus actually has more recent episodes than Netflix does now. <laughs> and, um, and then Amazon Prime, if you happen to have that, it was on Amazon as well. Okay. So. Okay. I have Netflix, so that, that seems to be the easiest one to, to use. So yeah. dive right, dive right in, Gary. 2005. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, by the way, is it is this one of those things where each doctor, because I know different people have played the doctor, is it is it a continuing thing? Are there within the series? What am I, is, is it a James Bond thing where it's like different people playing the doctor, or does the doctor change himself? It's like, different like, people playing the doctor, but at the same time, he does actually change. Okay. His gotcha. character with each actor. So. With number nine, which is Christopher Eccleston, you'll find that he's a much darker character. He's okay. very unhappy and bitter. But then you end up with number ten, played by David Tennant, and he's a much, like, he's a bit happier okay. and out, okay. more outgoing, I guess. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people love number ten. Okay. Uh, but honestly, I started watching from 2005, and I really loved the darker Christopher Eccleston, and it took me, like, half a season to even like Tenet. <laughs> okay, okay. But, I and and Matt Smith, I think, is a little more chipper than Tenet. Okay. Well, not chipper, okay. but sunny. I'm, I'm trying to think of a good way to describe Matt Smith, but um, I was actually much more accepting sooner in Matt Smith's uh, time as the Doctor. I was more accepting of him than I was of Tenet, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are like, how could you say such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Gary, okay. the Doctor is the same being. Okay. He, yeah. He just, he just changes form and shape, or not shape. Form and shape. <laughs> he he changes his form, and along with the form, like different characteristics may disappear, or he may have new characteristics. So okay. he might have different likes or dislikes or interests with each reincarnation or each regeneration. Okay. So, no. Um, have all of you have all of you <laughs> seen? Uh, uh, obviously, Anessa, you probably you haven't because you just said that you started two thousand five. But have you seen the way, 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 way older stuff? I've the seen on a video? little bit. Uh, okay. <laughs> I've I've seen maybe like, um, I guess with the older episodes they had like a little series, so yeah. it would be like five, four or five episodes would tie into one thing. Okay. And I've seen maybe two or three of those, but I haven't seen much. But Brad and Dave, I'm, I believe, have seen a lot more than I have. Yeah, I, the series. I, I can only take so much of that because the, the effects are so bad. and They're they so drag, awesome. They drag, they drag. But by, by the way, Dave, at, were, were, they, were they good for the time, or were, was, it, was it just cheesy even back then? Okay, so here's an example. Um, I believe it's the arc. Um, anyway, there's this this arc out in space, and there's a bunch of people that are uh, like kind of cryogenically frozen, okay. and there's a creature that gets on board the arc, and it ends up invading. Um, it's like a parasite, and invades a host, and the host ends up turning into another creature, and it just keeps reproducing. And I was watching it with my roommate one day. And there was, at one point, one of the scientists had become infected with this parasite, and he had his hand in his pocket. And he pulls his hand out of his pocket, and my first thought was, is that bubble wrap? And it was bubble wrap, spray-painted yeah. green. <laughs> you know, the, the, That's how awesome the effects are. And then they have, like, a, an, a corridor at the outside of the arc, and you have stars in the background. And it's like the last two, two and a half windows, they like run out of stars. It's just total <laughs> darkness. So. Yeah, they, didn't the, they didn't have the highest effects budget <laughs> no. in the world. You know, when, when you watch, <laughs> starting in 2005, they, they had just brought it back. They weren't, BBC wasn't too sure if they wanted to continue. There just seemed to be some behind the scenes, we're not sure. Then as you get to the more recent stuff, they're shooting mini movies now. Okay. okay. Um, but when you go back, 
even further before 2005. This was a, a show that you know not everybody in the BBC had wholly believed right. in, and right. they didn't want they didn't have a budget for it. So they literally scraped together creatures out of just stuff that was laying around. Right. Um, so you know some of that, and they do kind of do a tips of the hat and a little bit of cheese, kind of acknowledging the history of of Doctor Who with some things. Right. Uh, there was an episode with Simon Pegg. Um, playing a character and, and the alien and that just look kind of weird and cheesy and it just felt like they were <clears throat> acknowledging the past of Doctor Who. So yeah, okay. they, right. it, it gets better as you go. So I, yeah. I recommend you dive right in there, Gary. You got it. 2005. All right. Yep. Let's stay on you for a second and let's talk about The Matrix. I had to pick a story and I, I was... I was uh, I, I, I froze. I, I, I had two things I wanted to toss out. Um, one was a rhetorical question. Does Atlas Shrug that counts as science fiction? Ponder that one for a while. And two, uh, the news that the rumor that um, there are the, the uh, Warner Brothers and the Wachowski siblings are in the early stages of planning out a prequel trilogy to The Matrix. Now, good, bad, discussed. That's what I assume this is here to do. Me, personally, I do not have the venomous feelings towards the Matrix trilogy that everyone seems to have. I, I, I will acknowledge that one... That you, two and three certainly don't outdo one. I, I, I will acknowledge that. But, geez, they were so fun to look at. Yes, they kind of they, they, they kind of became... Um, Wachowski, uh, uh, New Age, Psychobabble towards the end, but I thought it was Psychobabble that was so beautiful looking. I mean, I, I remember stupid things like like uh, in in two, Neo in the uh, in that in that fight scene that where where uh, uh, Mr. Smith just keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. Yeah. And multiplying. Yeah. I, I remember just thinking. If that's all this is, I'm fine with you having my money. That was just <laughs> badass. Um, so I, but, but like I said, I, I get I get the eye rolling aspect because by three people had pretty much checked out and and they had realized that wow, this was never meant as a trilogy. This was so meant as one film that became a a, a cash grab for two more films. But um, but I still admit a guilty pleasure in liking that. I'm kind of curious. What a prequel involves, and or and 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 also in this day and age, uh, 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 we're not so easy. I mean, you, you watch something like the Avengers, or, or or take your pick of whatever big budget at the time, and it looks like it's actually happening. So I'm not sure we're as easily dazzled with cool effects anymore, considering how incredible effects are nowadays. Could this work? You know, I the, the, when. And I watched all three, um, saw them all in the theater. And when we got to the end of the th of three, there were so many questions as to how did we get here? You know, mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'm not really spoiling anything for anyone because it's been out right. forever. Um, but how did the system get to be that way? How did the programs become self-aware? How did how did all of this stuff happen? It just didn't feel like it had been. There were so many questions left at the end, I guess, and it would be nice to see them do a prequel and try to go over the Matrix and how it was constructed or how the original programs you know, started to become self-aware and, and, and how that whole society happened. You know, For this to work best, do you think it would have to be more of a, a Caprica kind of scenario where it's like, Number of years beforehand, completely different cast that just happens oh, to wind yeah. up veering in the direction of where the original Matrix uh, starts. You know? Well, we know that there was a one before Neo, so mm -hmm. it would be interesting to see the prequel do the setup of how this system was created and then the new one appearing, and that be like the end of the trilogy. You know, right? Not not necessarily right. going through another whole. Hero, hero discovered, hero yeah. defined, hero defeated, whole story arc, but just voop, and here's the new one, and we're done. You know, right. we've explained right. the world to you and how it happened the first time. 
And that I think cool. that's that's what would essentially have to happen because I loved the first Matrix, and like everyone else, two was man, three was kind of. At the end of three, I was like, well, "What the hell happened?" Um, yeah. But in, in in one, in the start of one, Neo is mildly described as the type of person he is, and then it jumps into the Matrix, and then you do all the character development. There isn't a whole lot of time spent explaining in depth the Matrix. So I think the 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 prequel trilogy, like Brad said, could be you know the first person that found the first person that became self aware, the first person that essentially you know took the pill, and the first person that was then removed um, because you in the existing trilogy when Neo comes out of the haze, there's underground railroads set up and there's you know ships right. and and civilizations and all this stuff so. Uh, a prequel trilogy could easily go back and t- explain all that. Now, like Gary said, uh, it's really hard to impress people these days. Uh, and as I had mentioned in, in a previous podcast, uh, everyone wants everything to blow up, and they want it to blow up big. Um, Curse you, Michael Bay. Yes, the Michael Bay effect. So this movie could get <laughs> Michael bay beyond belief, and there could just be big explosions and big fights, and it, it just turns into, you know, six solid hours of explosions or they could do it right and they could write a, a solid story and answer all the questions that people have had since the first Matrix came out, what, 99? So all yeah. these questions that people have had since 1999 could be answered or it could turn into a, how much money can we make by lighting up the screen for a couple hours. So I don't think they'll do that. You know, And you could actually go really, really far back because artificial intelligence is happening now in the form of Siri, in the form of Google mm-hmm. Now. You could you could you could start it from there. You could start it from people's personal assistants, right? And 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 make the leap, make the jump to whatever is next. And that could be the that could be the beginning, the the spark for the Matrix. So either way, it's going to be interesting. The Wachowskis have definitely changed as filmmakers over time, and. Kind of curious to see what they would pull off. They're, they're, they're certainly still, even with Cloud Atlas, they're still very ambitious filmmakers. Uh, whether they succeed or fail, they definitely uh, swing for the fences. And this next this next movie looks awesome. This next movie looks spectacular. It's just amazing. That's right. I forgot about that. That, that, that trailer just debuted what, a couple days ago? Yeah. Yeah, Jupiter Rising, right? Yeah. That's, yeah. It... Yep. Yeah. No, Jupiter Ascending. Ascending, okay. Rising, ascending, whatever. Yeah, Upper I keep ascending. wanting to call it Jupiter Rising. Yeah, I for do some too. Reason, and I'm like, no, it's ascending. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think depending on how well that movie does, that that is that will be the fate of the next Matrix. The That's a very good point. That is a yeah. very because I think I think they lost some. Uh, studios really want to bankroll you when your movies make a hundred million dollars. When they cost. Mm-hmm. Two hundred million. They're not breaking that. Yeah, the, the the budget might become a lot tighter and the expectations a lot different. Yeah. yeah. But then, at the same time, they can maybe focus more on story than the yes. big effects. Yes. I was thinking that too. I was yep. thinking the same thing. Yep. Good point. Very good yep. point. All right. Time will tell. Uh, let's move on to the final story, and that is Anessa's. Sci-Fi Museum. Yay! Woo-hoo! <laughs> <laughs> came across this article and I got all excited. Um, so yeah, it was announced on February 25th that um, the planned Museum of Science Fiction will be partnering with the Science Channel, um, and the Science Channel will be providing sponsorship and content for the new venture. And the museum is going to be in Washington, D.C., and it is a standalone nonprofit museum that aims to showcase science, uh, science fiction in literature, TV, film, music, video games, and art. And um, the museum aims to open a preview space later this year and plans to launch the full museum in early 2017. So um, it's going to feature seven sci-fi galleries, including uh, the creators, vehicles, time travel concepts, aliens, computers, robots, and technology. Um, And sci-fi collectors have offered to loan materials for the exhibits, including models from Star Trek films and Battlestar Galactica. So, and... 
yeah, it just sounds like it's going to be awesome. But the other point of the museum is we're trying to spark interest in STEAM, so sci science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematic fields. So that's a good way to, you know, get kids in there to see these exhibits and be like, hey, look, on Star Trek, they had what looks like a cell phone and a tablet, and eventually it became the iPad <laughs> and your flip phone. Like, look how technology is predicted through these science fiction TV shows and stories, and you can kind of, like, spark Im an imagination in the kids and an interest, and they can be like, wow, I really want to do something like that. I want to be able to create something that I've thought of. And so I think that's a really awesome angle for them to get at, too, because you really got to get kids interested these days Where's in science and technology, because there's a Absolutely. whole lot of kids that are just... Yeah. Even even in the astronomy classes now at the university that I work at, half of them are like, I don't understand math. Or like, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an English major. Like, why do I have to know this? And they just immediately brush off astronomy or any concept of science off to the side. I'm like, it's really important because you wouldn't have what you have now if it weren't for science. Well, the, these kids, these <laughs> kids need they they're going to need science because those are the only fields as soon as the the great um uh technological um uh, singularity happens we're gonna, <laughs> the robots are going to take over all the menial jobs so you better know science you better know science robots are already <laughs> starting right, to write poetry so we don't need the english science. majors <laughs> <laughs> that's true i mean wow. uh, artistic jobs as well i guess the robots won't take those either well, no, but I mean, I just saw an article the other day that had uh, a sample of poetry that was written by a robot and another sample by a human. It was like, can you tell the difference? Yeah, it was the, it was like a Turing test for for the robots. Yeah, we, we posted yeah. it on the uh, Galactic Netcast yeah. feed. So. There you go. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I think this is really going to be cool. And I've always wanted to go to D.C. and see like the touristy spots and museums, and this is just going to add to... That <laughs> Could you imagine going to Smithsonian and then this, like, back-to-back? -back? There's so many... They, when, when, when do you anticipate this museum being up? What, what, what's, the, what's the launch uh, date that they like to have? 2017. Um, okay. It just says early 2017, so okay. about three years from now. Wow. Cool. That's, that's and, exciting. That's really good. Yeah, yeah and I think this year, I want to say also included in the article, which is fairly long, um... They're going to have an awesome con <laughs> that embraces all aspects of geekdom and pop culture, and it's going to be held April 18th through 20th at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center in D.C. That's, that's a great so way to So people in that area, but it's like awesome con. That's a great way to tie in that museum <laughs> is to use a convention. to you Yeah, know, and they're going to have, I believe they're going to have like a small all like mini museum type setup there and I guess that's going to help drum up interest and promote the museum that's going to be opening in 2017. So, so that's really cool. I'm actually excited for it. <laughs> I, I feel like there's becoming this uh, in I don't want to say interest kind of like a, a, a fish tank effect I guess you could call it for ultra nerds. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar, but there's a TV show on TBS uh, called King of the Nerds. Yeah, I just watched the first episode of the first season. Like, yes. This week. <laughs> I've actually I never heard of it. I love that show, but I love that show for the wrong reasons. I love that show for the same reason that I love Teen Mom. I love both <laughs> of these shows. Hey, hey, man, I stand by what I say. I watch these shows. Oh, I know. Because of the... <laughs> get out of here, Brad. I knew where you were going with this, Matt. I knew yeah, I, I, wreck, right? Yes. I watch, I watch these shows because of the poor social interactions that these people have and how skewed their perception of reality is. Now, it's different, different aspects of it. Teen Mom, these people don't understand reality because they've been on TV since they were 16 and they get paid stupid amounts of money because they got knocked up and they're socially retarded. But... You know, on, the, on the other hand... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And I was just going to say, like, I read not too long ago that they actually found a decline in teen pregnancy because they yep. attributed the decline 
to Teen Mom. Hey, and oh, I guess when, a lot when of people are like, be? I don't want to be like that. I would love to believe that. that I'd like, like, I know. I I'm like, that would be awesome if that was actually the case. And I agree, because that's, that's, that's MTV's quote-unquote reason for the show. And now I don't believe that for a second, because no. those people, every week, something dumb happens. Now, right. back to my point. I watch King of the Nerds um, not because I find it interesting, but these people don't have social skills or the ability to function socially in a room or a house full of people. So I watch it to see, and more specifically, there is a guy on this season who uh, people push his buttons, and they do it on purpose, and he just loses his mind, and he starts like screaming at him for no reason. And I, a coworker and I actually have talks about this every Friday morning to see how this guy went off the deep end and how hilarious it is. So... I feel that it's kind of almost giving nerdy people a bad name. So I think that this uh, museum, although being uh, put up and for all the right reasons, I think that it might backfire and fail. I don't want it to, obviously, no. because I'm well, here. it might I actually this is... interest in people coming to see what it's all about. It'll spark some curiosity, maybe. I and, think I, and I hope so. I, I obviously, I'll be the first one to say that uh, people younger than me, and I know Brad's going to get sad because there are people younger than me, um, <laughs> there's not a whole lot of social skill and there's not a whole lot of interest in technology. And that's, I make my money off of technology. And, you know, all of us do in some fashion. Um, and it, it's unfortunate that the younger generations don't know how you know, they don't have the gumption to, like, open up a computer and see how it works. And Would and you like together. my pince-nez when you say that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are the only yes. young person that I know. You, well, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to say that I'm... I'm I, maybe I am old at heart. I don't know. I go to bed at, like, 9.30. Um, I just think that... It's past your bedtime. It is past my bedtime. <laughs> I, just, I just think that I, I was fortunate enough to have parents that, you know forced me to work for what I have. Yeah, they let me be a stupid teenager and think I was going to be famous in a rock band. But when it came down to it, they're like, hey, go to school and get a job, asshole. <laughs> I, I, I think, think a, lot of, a lot of kids' parents don't do that. They baby their kids, and they're like, yeah, here's an iPhone, here's an iPad. Yeah, whatever, oh, I'll yeah. pay they your cell phone bill. But, but Matt, they you have to remember that, that this is Washington, D.C., and schools from around the country bring their kids into Washington, D.C. to go to the Smithsonian and all these other museums. No, that's if, very true. And if they, can, if they can get something out of going to this museum as well, make it on their route of museums to check out, if it affects them to be more into science, then more power to them. And I, how I would go to this, and I am the least, I'm the least into science fiction out of all of us, and this seems interesting to me. Um... Uh, going, going back to Doctor Who, I've seen one episode of Doctor Who, and that's because Dave made me watch it for a different podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> Battlestar Galactica is only on my radar because of Dwight Schrute. And when you see when you Bears. say Battlestar Galactica, I think of Bears Beats and Battlestar yep. Galactica. Yep. <laughs> oh, 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 God. I think I just broke Gary's heart. <laughs> I I, 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 I I love that show. I that but, that show that show to me, in my opinion, it's it's uh, the best television show that no. has ever ever been. I had a feeling, Gary, that you were an Uber fan when you mentioned Caprica, because hardly anybody knows ever that. Mentions show. Caprica. No, I, didn't, <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about, but uh, I didn't want to. It was adorable to watch your eyes glaze over. Too. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> You guys started talking about all this stuff, and I was like, oh, let's see what's on Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think that wraps it up. I think that's the show. Um, good job. Well well done, everybody. Um, all great, great stories. And uh, if our listeners have feedback on any of the stuff that we've talked about tonight, please let us know. We've got an email, galacticnetcasts at gmail.com. We've got a voicemail number. That's 805-328-3966. Got the website, galacticnetcast.com. There you can find all the links to our social networks and how to subscribe to the show. Hey, Dave. Yes. Can I, can I say something real quick? Sure. I would like to thank Gary 
for coming on the show. Um, I've mentioned I'm a huge Simpsons fan. I have an entire Simpsons tattoo chest piece. Um, so he drew a picture of my wife and I on on the couch with a bunch of Halloween stuff, and that was like my one step to being on the Simpsons. So I am 100% in fanboy mode right now. But I do want to thank him for coming. Uh, it was really cool. Um, please, I urge everyone to go donate money to thelastpodcast.com. Um, yes, and thank you, Gary. And anybody interested in having their own Simpsons or King of the Hill commission, uh, go to lastpodcast.com. All the information is there, how to reach me, my email address, my Twitter, all that kind of stuff. I love love Twitter. It's the only social networking site I'm on. I love that. Um, and and help us get to this goal. It's a really, really, really good charity for a really, really, really good cause. And uh, Matt gave some money, too. I saw he did. I, his name he was did. on your website. I'm like, yes. Oh, I didn't give Gary enough money the first time around, so I gotta give him more. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I th- I thank you guys for having me. I I, I hope it. W- I hope I did okay. This this oh, was an honor was great, and a and a and a and a. I, I can't thank you guys enough for letting me spread uh, the word uh, as much as possible. We we definitely like to have you have you come back, Gary, because I I've anytime. Been, I'd love to I'd love to talk Battlestar Galactica with you. That'd- yes. <laughs> <laughs> anytime, any any time whatsoever. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Sci-Fi Geeks Club. And hang on one second, where's my gavel? I call this meeting adjourned. Good night, everybody. Bye, Good Dad. Night. Good night. <laughs>